Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Akash for firstly organising such a great meeting and for inviting me to give this update on tubes. I'm only sorry that I'll not be with you at the time of the meeting because unfortunately I'll be overseas. I do have a financial disclosure uh, relevant to this talk in that I uh, consult with a advanced ophthalmic innovations who make the pole glaucoma implant and I have a share in the royalties as I was one of the co-inventors. Since I started implanting tubes in the mid 90s, right at the start there were some myths that I feel ought to be addressed. I was told that after 10 years all the corneas fail. Now that's not true, some do and it is to some degree technique dependent. But here's a video taken a year ago in a patient with a Maltina that was implanted in the 90s and a Barvelt that was implanted in 2002. This patient's got twice as much reason for the cornea to fail and the cornea is still clear. This is a patient who's especially at high risk because of severe primary angle closure. Severe primary angle closure is at higher risk of corneal failure because of very high pressures to start with, but also because there's not much space in the anterior chamber. So the tube inevitably can end up closer to the cornea than would be ideal. Yet after 20 years, this cornea is still clear. Here's another patient, the video uh, two years ago of a bar belt, 20 years beforehand in the right eye and 19 years beforehand in the left eye and bilateral aphakic uveitis. Again, eyes that have had high pressures and chronic inflammation and a higher risk of the cornea. The second myth was that you don't get low pressures. A successful tube when I started was believed to be a pressure between 21 and 23 on two medications. This bilaterally aphakic aneuritic patient underwent bilateral barvelt implantation by myself 20 years ago when he was 15 years old. The tubes are longer than ideal and perhaps he migrated over the years because I don't usually leave them that long, but they're well positioned, clear of cornea, and the corneas are no different than they were 20 years ago. And the pressure is nine in each eye and uh, one eye is on COSOPT. This study was the study that really got me interested in the bar belt. It showed that in 1999, in a randomized clinical trial comparing the 350 bar belt, which was in commercial production with a 500 that they were evaluating, which never made commercial production, that the 350 could achieve 79% cumulative success at five years with a pressure of 13.7 on one medication. And up to then, there was really no convincing evidence that tubes could get low target pressures. But this study was a randomized clinical trial and it wasn't a commercial trial. The third myth that I've been trying to crack for a lot of years, it's always been my, my um, goal in life, is that Glaucoma surgical procedures are all time limited. You do one, then you do another, then you do another. You know, we really need to be getting past that. We need something that's long lasting, that, that works forever. So that you don't always need something in reserve. Tubes all started with Maltino, and I'm giving you some background, although this is an update, because just to put everything in context. Permanent sclerostomy doesn't close equatorial drainage because equatorial fibroblasts are less active, plate to prevent external obstruction, but the plate also predetermines a bleb surface area. But the problem with the Maltina was perceived high risk of complications from early hypotony, and as I mentioned earlier, long-term IOP control was not very good. In the early to mid 90s, the Ahmed valve and the Barvelt 350 appeared in relatively short succession. The Ahmed valve obviously has got the flow resistor, whereas the Barvelt has the very big uh, flexible aerodynamic plate. And when put head to head in randomized clinical trials, there were two prospective randomized clinical trials, the ABC and the AVB studies. These two concurrent randomized clinical trials uh, yielded similar outcomes, i.e. that the bar belt gave better pressure control, but the AMAD had a better safety profile. And when you pull the results that of the two studies, that accentuates the difference in IOP control. When the data from these two concurrent randomized clinical trials were pooled, there were 176 AMAD valves at five years and 170 bar belts, so quite a large cohort.
and there's a clear difference in pressure control with the bar valve achieving lower pressures on fewer medications. The IOP difference at five years was more than three millimeters mercury and the bar valves were also on slightly fewer medications. Both were statistically significant. The bar valves did have a slightly worse safety profile, but this related specifically to the neovasculars and severe neovasculars we know don't do well with large plates. So they probably shouldn't have been included in, this, in these studies. It seemed from the two implants that were developed in the 90s that the AMID valve fixed the hypotony problem with its uh, flow resistor, whereas the bar vault uh, fixed the, the pressure control problem, but neither implant fixed both. There are a number of reasons that the almond was felt to be a little less effective. Um, one was the plate size, which was smaller than the bar vault. Secondly, it allows early aqueous flow, which was thought to be more fibrogenic. Um, thirdly, uh, on electron microscopy, the almond has a rougher surface. The bar vault multino much more polished and uh, in tissue culture, fibroblasts stick to the AMID valve much more than they do to bar valve or Maltino, as you can see here. These clips show the difference in thickness of the bar valve and AMID plates. You can see that the AMID valve is two and a half millimeters thick over the flow restrictor mechanism, whereas the bar valve is only 1.3 1 quarter millimeters thick, and that's only over a small area of a ridge whereas the majority of the bar vault is less than a millimeter thick, so it's a much lower profile implant, which may account for some of the different uh, properties. A great advantage of the tube implants is their versatility in different circumstances. Obviously, this is especially true in situations where trabeculectomy would have a poor prospect of success. This 44-year-old Indian lady is a good example, presenting in December 2007. She's a high myope uncontrolled open angle glaucoma in the left, uh, pressure 28, slightly thin cornea, mean deviation of minus 32 and 618 acuity, uh, retinal attachment surgery in India in 1997, no light perception from birth and trauma in the right. So it's an only eye with very advanced glaucoma that's out of control and she's had a previous buckle. And it's a very strange looking uh, 360 degree sponge as well, at that as well. And that's her visual field. The only realistic option here was a bar valve implant, which you can see I've implanted behind the sponge. I then cut a little segment out of the sponge so that the tube could come forward on the scleral surface and uh, be implanted in the anterior chamber. In follow up, she had a left phaco and IOL in 2011. And her last visit on the 17th of June 2021, 13 years post op. The visual acuity was still 618 in the operated eye. The pressure was 10 millis mercury on lubricants only. And the tube was slightly anterior in the anterior chamber, but the cornea was clear. So quite a good result and really better than one would have expected. This is one of the first patients where I put a bar valve in, in when there was a pre-existing buckle. And you can see here I've brought the bar belt forward on top of the buckle which was low lying um, because otherwise it would have been very far back and at that point it was around 10 millimeters back which is satisfactory. Here I'm securing the bar belt to the buckle. As I say because the bar belt's low lying and the buckle was low lying that this could be achieved. The problem was I didn't really expect it to work. I thought this would just encapsulate and fail. And the reason that I've continued to do this over the years, even though there's a diminishing number of buckles, is because they actually do work. This is the same patient a few months after surgery, and the pressure is good. This is the same patient and the same eye 13 years after surgery. The pressure is 13 on no medication, and the vision's unchanged from the preoperative level. This patient has stickler syndrome is particularly uh, difficult. Uh, situation, but it shows you what results can be achieved. It's technically possible to implant a tube successfully in various situations with various impediments where external filtration will not otherwise work. These studies recruited refractory patients with complex secondary glaucomas. 
What about less exotic situations where we often implant tubes nowadays? A TVT study attempted to address this. Patients had one failed trab or previous cataract surgery. It was widely perceived because of the previous cataract surgery to be a study in low failure risk patients. And, and this is completely untrue. It's important to be aware that 88% of patients in the TVT study had some form of prior conjunctival surgery, either trabeculectomy or scleral tunnel cataract surgery. Only 12% of the entire total were clear cornea phaco. So the majority of the patients in this study are roughly representative of a population who had prior TRAB. And the results were published uh, back in 2012 at five years. While the pressures at five years were slightly better in the TRAB group, and they were on marginally fewer medications than the tubes. And while the chance of getting off medication with the TRAB is slightly higher, 29% absolute success compared with 25% with the tube, the chance of success in terms of qualified success, i.e. being on medication with decent pressure control without requiring further surgery, was much higher in the tube group. The graph on the left shows that the failure rate was higher in the trabeculectomy group if the target pressure was 21 mils mercury or less. But the two graphs on the right show that with lower pressure um, uh, targets, tubes also had a better success rate than traps. Although when you get down to less than 14 on the far right, the difference is less. In the TVT study, almost all of the tube failures were from inadequate IOP reduction, whereas the TRAB failures were from both inadequate IOP reduction and from hypotony. It, it seemed that there was a narrower range of outcomes in the tube group, i.e. that they were a little bit more predictable. Overall, there were similar outcomes from TRABs and tubes in the TBT study, although tubes had many more qualified successes and seemed to be a little more predictable than TRABs. This particularly applies to the Barbell 350, though not to any tube. This study was superseded by the primary TBT study, which has recently published five-year results. And this was to compare the efficacy and safety of tube surgery versus TRAB in patients with no previous intraocular surgery. And you can see at five years, the pressures are very similar. Again, the tube tr tubes are slightly higher pressures than the TRABs, which they did more or less all the way through. But the complete successes were much higher in the TRAB group than the tube group. When we look at the probability of failure, which was the primary outcome, it was higher in the tube group. Though the difference was not as wide as with complete successes because this takes into account qualified successes. Tubes tended to fail from inadequate IOP reduction, as did TRABs. They had more reoperations for glaucoma, but again, TRABs failed in some cases from persistent hypotony, which tubes didn't. The study investigators were particularly concerned about tubes not doing so well because they tended in general to be tube fans and were a bit dismayed that tubes didn't do so well. When the data was dredged to see what the reason might be, there was one predictive factor, which was preoperative IOP. You can see that if pre-op IOP was less than 21, TRABs did significantly better than tubes. If the preoperative IOP was between 21 and 25, the, the gap narrows. If the pre-op IOP was more than 25, tubes actually had a higher success rate than TRABs. Tubes work in almost anyone to some degree, but less so in the low risk primary cases. But it depends which tube you use. This statement applies really to the bar belt 1 and 1 350. Implanting tubes in low risk primary cases requires a technique that will predictably deliver physiological early IOP levels. And this is a big challenge. I rapidly moved away from the traditional ligature technique, which uh, was to my mind too binary, giving high early pressures or, or low if the ligature was inadequate. 
The traditional ligature technique is illustrated on the left, and I rapidly moved to using a ripcord or stenting technique as demonstrated on the right, which is more versatile and there are various permutations allowing a full length stenting through a very tight entry site or additional ligatures that can be lasered um, and then later complete removal. So it offers uh, options that are not available with a single binary ligature. You can see that this bar belt is stented with a 3 oethylon occluding suture that is inadequate. There's far too much flow. Here's the same one when I've added a 10 o nylon adjunctive ligature, which has reduced the flow but not obliterated it. Therefore, hopefully you still get physiological pressures afterwards. Here there are three 10 o nylon ligatures squeezing the tube gently around the 3 o ethylon. These 10 o nylon can be lasered later. It is important to be aware that in some cases the large bar belt or a large plate will carry a high risk of chronic hypotony. These include severe uveitis from early childhood, severe neovasculars, um, chemical burns where the ciliary body might have been severely damaged. What you do then, in very bad cases, I use a single plate Maltino. Uh, in less sick eyes, a 250 or a bar belt or an amid valve. The problems with tubes, as we've mentioned, are plate encapsulation and high pressure predictability of early IOP control, but also there's miscellaneous tube-related morbidity problems such as diplopia, endothelial cell loss, and conjunctival erosion. The challenges in avoiding these include putting the plate in the right place and putting the tube in the right place, not surprisingly. It's important not to compromise plate placement because of obstacles. I aim to get the plate as far from the limbs as possible, around ideally around 10 millimeters. And in general, when people haven't done that, I think it's because they haven't made the perisomy big enough and haven't done a, a big enough dissection. You really want the plate back like this, not like this. And you can see the one on the right is red and encapsulated. And, and these just look ugly, apart from the fact they don't work. Putting the tube in the right place is important, and the, we carried out a prospective five-year study of, end, of risk factors for endothelial cell loss. In the recruited patients, roughly half had uveitis and almost half had POAG with a small number of secondaries as well. You can see the only difference in the preoperative characteristics of these patients was that uveitis tended to have higher recorded pressures. Uh, be on slightly more medications and had more uh, PAS and more flare, but they also had slightly thinner corneas. But there's no difference in the preoperative corneal endothelial cell characteristics between these groups. But corneal endothelial cell density dropped off quite dramatically over time. Uh, you can see both the central and the peripheral endothelial cell densities here. With peripheral endothelial cell density over the area of the tube dropping by 50% at five years. When we looked at the relationship between tube entry site position and the angle and endothelial cell loss over time, the results were quite interesting. If all of the tube entry site was behind Schwab's line, it was less than 25% endothelial cell loss at five years. If most of the tube was anterior to Schwalbe's line, the, the rate of loss was almost 50%. Interestingly, if the tube was right in the cornea, it was slightly lower, which was unexpected. People tend to focus on the tube tip position, but it's actually the entry site position that seems to be of greater importance. What about the sulcus? This study from UCSF looked at sulcus versus anterior chamber fixation of amid valves and not surprisingly found that endothelial cell loss was less than the sulcus. However, interestingly, there was still a significant loss of endothelial cells even with sulcus placed uh, amid valves. And in fact, the endothelial cell loss they, they observed in the sulcus was actually marginally worse than what we found in the peripheral angle behind Schwalbe's line though probably not significantly so. So if there's no space in the angle for a tube, don't put it in the peripheral cornea. 
if you can find a space between the PAS, well and good, but if the angle is zipped, put it in the sulcus, uh, and ideally through a PI so you can see the tip. And I make PIs nowadays with the vitrectomy forceps and scissors. I find this is the easiest way uh, to maintain a view of the cornea. Uh, you want a very clear corneal view when you're doing this so that you can see where the tube's going behind the PI. If you make an incision over the PI, then you lose clarity. If there's no space at all, either because the eye is very small, such as a nanophthalmus, occasionally there's no angle, for instance, after corneal grafting, if there's been iris adherence to the to the host and no sulcus for whatever reason, then you've really no choice but to put the tube in the pars plana. Pars plana implantation is a good option but requires a pars plana vitrectomy. It's worth repeating the vitrectomy before pars plana tube implantation even if the patient's had a prior vitrectomy. Here's a pars plana tube where there's been a pars plana vitrectomy and still the tube has caught vitreous base. I've had bad experiences with pars plana modified implants in that the small plastic limbal plate tends to erode even when patched properly. So I usually avoid the pars plana modified implants for either barbelt or amid, but use the regular implant in the pars plana. As I mentioned earlier, the current implants date from the mid early to mid 90s. The only real change was the amid valve uh, moved from the polypropylene S2 to the flexible silicon FP7 in the mid noughties. Um, but there hasn't really been much fundamental change until recently. Have tubes evolved? Well, there has been little uh, evolution, but the uh, pole glocum implant is one. The breadth of the pole glocum implant is less than that of a bar belt, and the depth is a millimeter greater. This change in plate design should result in more usable plate surface area that's not covered by rectus muscles. The tube lumen of the PGI at 127 microns is smaller than that of an amid valve or a bar valve implant. In fact, it's less than half and only large, slightly larger than a pressure flow as seen here. In profile, you can see the dramatic difference between the bar vault, the pressure flow and the pole. As I mentioned, the pole lumen is less than half of that of the bar vault. This is important as until recently commercially available tubes have been much larger than required. At 640 microns in diameter, conventional tubes occupy the entire drainage angle and must rest on iris to avoid corneal damage. Tube contact with cornea at the entry site kills endothelial cells. A large tube on the scleral surface also carries a long-term erosion risk, even when covered with a donor patch graft. A smaller tube in the angle, such as the pole here, should in theory result in less corneal endothelial cell loss. This one, in fact, is in the sulcus, which is even better. And a smaller tube in the surface should in theory run a lower risk of conjunctival erosion. The tube lumen of the pole glocum implant is less than half of an amid valve or a bar valve lumen and can therefore be occluded with a 6-0 proline suture to reduce flow rather than the 3-0 used in the bar valve. The tube is typically stented all the way into the anterior chamber. In most cases, this provides enough resistance to prevent early hypotony. This proline stent is seen here in the chamber in gonioscopy. However, I think you do need to examine the back of the plate for aqueous drainage. In contrast to ligation of the tube, which risks high early IOP, stenting permits regulation of aqueous flow. Here's the drainage coming out the back of the tube, and this is roughly an adequate rate. You can insert a dry sponge into the small well at the back of the plate, and then slow aqueous filling of the well should be visualized. If the well isn't filling, the IOP is likely to remain high in the early postoperative period. In that situation, you can withdraw the rip cord a bit uh, until you get decent flow. If drainage is brisk, however, such as here, then there will be a very high risk of early hypotony. And in that situation, I push the rip cord further and uh, ensure that it's all the way up the tube. If it's already all the way up the tube and I'm getting brisk drainage,
then I would ligate in addition. But I resort to ligation in a very small proportion of uh, patients these days. And I ligate typically with 10 o nylon, which can be lasered later. If no drainage is visible, the 6O can be withdrawn stepwise. Sometimes it only needs to be a few millimeters along the tube, such as here. If no drainage is visible, ensure the pressure is adequate. And I'm injecting BSS via 30 gauge needle here as there's no paracentesis. And now the well seems to be filling again. I used fluorescein seen here, but it didn't really help. Rarely I find 6O to be too tight and I've resorted to 7O, but that was only one batch once. So vast majority of time I use 6O. And overall, the simple flow control technique minimizes the risk of post-op IOP extremes after the pole glaucoma implant. We published this six center a bunch of cases in 2020 in ophthalmology glaucoma. And I'm just going to compare the one year results of our study with the one year Barvelt results in the pooled analysis of the ABZ and AVB studies. At one year with the ABB ABC study, the Barvelts were achieving 13.7 millimeters of mercury on 1.4 medications. At one year in our uh, six center case uh, series of the poles, we we're achieving very similar results, 13.2 on 0.3 medications. We recently looked at our International Glaucoma Surgery Registry, um, Paul and Barvelt patients, and you can see the poles tended to have slightly higher pressures at uh, enrollment on similar medications and with slightly lower visual field uh, damage than the bar belts, but overall similar numbers. At one year, the bar belts and poles were achieving similar pressures on similar amounts of medication. The pole on marginally lower number of medications, but almost no, no difference. When we started doing poles, very unexpectedly, we found that the 6O occlusion uh, system seemed to produce much more predictable early pressures than we were achieving with Barvelts using a similar system on a 3 um, nylon. And you can see here on day one, the pole pressures seem to be much more tightly clustered than the Barvelts. There are a few, there are two, as you can see, around 40 and one at roughly 32 uh, in the poles, but uh, many fewer high pressures when the bar belts than the bar belts and also at fewer low pressures they seem to be clustered and the same is true at day seven in conclusion conventional tube design is more than 25 years old with appropriate technique it is possible to get low long-term iops without destroying the cornea although it does require careful technique Reducing the tube diameter as in the pole glaucoma implant is a very obvious fix that should have been produced long ago and should produce some benefits. The big unexpected benefit of the pole has been the more predictable early IOP levels, which we really hadn't anticipated. Thank you very much for your attention and for the very kind invitation. I hope you enjoy the meeting. I'm very sorry not to be there with you.